Welcome to um, session two. Um, I'm honoured to introduce session two, which will encompass what might Frobelian uh, led reform look like in our current education system and how can educators make sure the babies and children in our care get the education they deserve. We have three fabulous um, presentations that I'm sure um, you'll be um, interested to hear about. The following three presenters will begin with Susanna Castro-Kemp, followed by Simon Bateson with Shaddai Tembo, and then an Isira um, special interest group. All three presentations will be showcasing their project work, connecting key Frobelian principles in the 21st century, with a focus on the child as a unique individual, reflecting on the significance of relationships with educators and the interconnectedness between policy, theory and practice, as well as enactment in practice. I'm sure I can speak for many of us here today about how fortunate we are to learn about the following valuable projects that are being presented. I just wanted to say, as a gentle reminder, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentations. So please type any um, questions in the Q&A function. And after the last speaker, I will post these as many as I can um, to the speakers and we can have um, some shared dialogue about their projects. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Susanna Castro-Kemp, an Associate Professor in Psychology and Human Development at UCL Institute of Education in London, and her latest research considering whether Ofsted inspectors value for abelian principles and ask what makes an outstanding nursery. She'll be discussing the results of her research and making the case for inspection guide, guidelines to refocus on the whole child through play, creativity and imagination. The aim of her study is to generate evidence of what constitutes high quality early years provision from the Ofsted point of view, which is also examining how there are judgments aligned with internationally recognised principles of early years education and Frobelian pedagogies. It aims to renew an understanding of Frobelian pedagogy as a methodological research tool and a framework to guide quality assurance of early year settings. So I think it will be a really fascinating talk and I'm really keen um, to have a listen to what she has to say throughout her project. So Susanna, if you'd like to begin, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Amanda. So I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, good morning, um, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you to the Throbel Trust for the invite to present here today. Um, I'm going to present the results of this project that I led, Fro Frobel Meets Ofsted, What Makes an Outstanding Nursery? And just to say that, although I'm based at UCL Institute of Education now, this project was based at and administered by the University of Roehampton um, at the time. So, just to give you a little bit of um, uh, background of why we wanted to do this uh, study, there are uh, two trends in school inspections uh, in Europe um, towards two ends uh, in, a, in a continuum. We have the high stakes sanction oriented and we have the low stakes um, advisory focused. And these two trends vary um, in the way that they pursue the, the criteria to ensure high quality inspections. And those criteria are the ones you have on, on the right. So governance arrangements, the statutory powers of the inspectorate, the forms and the frequency of the visits, um, the level of emphasis on how much the school does a self-evaluation and action planning for improvement and the availability of support services. And so um, Simonov and colleagues looked at four European uh, countries in terms of how they pursue these criteria. And they find, found out that, for example, Greece, Italy and um, Spain, they have uh, inspection bodies that are within their ministries of education and so they are much more uh, close to a low stakes advisory focused approach um, to inspection. Um, but they also found that this is not the case um, in England where we have Ofsted, which is an independent body uh, that performs inspections to um, educational settings, as we know. Um, and 
And uh, the the research um, around uh, uh, Ofsted and this um, high stakes approach to inspection can be um, questions this this approach actually the research available. So Ofsted, we know that Ofsted rated school quality. Um, has been seen as a weak predictor of student well-being and engagement. And this was in a study using the National Pupil Database, which is the largest database of student outcomes in the country and the most complete in the world, potentially. Um, and uh, we know that uh, Ofsted ra ratings of quality only accounted for a very small percentage of variability in student scores, looking at this very large data set. This is um, in education in general, but this happens as well in earlier settings. So if we look at studies by Blinden and colleagues, we know um, there's evidence that there is a weak relationship between nursery characteristics as rated by Ofsted. Um, so whether they're outstanding um, and good, and then uh, later outcomes uh, when children achieve age five and they are in primary school in terms of the earliest foundation stage. So a very, very weak correlation. Um, we also know that this uh, this uh, mismatch between quality ratings and Ofsted ratings um, doesn't happen only in education settings. So we observed in analysis of um, uh, children's services, for example, that deprivation was the best single predictor of Ofsted outcomes in children's services, not the performance indicators. And this was the same across um, local authorities. And Ofsted statistics themselves, if we look at them on their uh, publicly available statistics on their website, outstanding, outstanding nurseries are much more common in the least deprived areas, which suggests that there may be other demographic or maybe family related variables or even inspective related variables, potentially uh, implicit bias, that might be influencing quality ratings rather than the objective quality criteria as defined by Ofsted. And lastly, just a little bit more of evidence uh, for you to understand why we wanted to do this study. Uh, we know that there's a lot of research, and I'm, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this, a uh, lot of research on uh, the use of psychometrically valid tools to assess quality of earlier settings, such as the early childhood environmental scale. These are very, very reliable scales. And these studies found a very, very weak correlation between the ratings of quality as given by these very valid tools and the offset um, ratings. So um, studies on the long term impact of high quality um, early childhood education as measured by these scales have shown the reduced likelihood of developing, for example, special educational needs in the future and the relationship with more positive outcomes in the future. But this doesn't happen with um, with the offset quality criteria. So there clearly is a mismatch between the scientific definitions of quality, which are reliable and have been studied uh, for many years and uh, are supported for very strong evidence, and uh, the Ofsted related criteria. So this leaves us in a very unclear situation where our nursery managers uh, don't know what, what um, inspectors are going to look at when they are going to inspect their settings. There is an unclear conceptualization of what makes a high quality early year setting from the inspector's point of view. And this is what we wanted to find out. So I'm going to very briefly present the results of two of our papers that result from this uh, project. And as I said, this is very briefly and hopefully you'll be able to see the results in full when the two studies are formally published. Um, so in the first paper, the two aims were to investigate the relationship between the children's reported outcomes in their two-year progress check, as reported by the nursery staff, and the um, offset rating of the setting that they attend, considering as well the postcode deprivation level, because as we saw in the previous evidence, this may play a role as well. And then we wanted to examine the relationship between the offset ratings and the specific content of the offset report. We wanted to see if we could identify any patterns of content that justify why some settings are rated as outstanding and others are not. So this is what we, um, we looked at in this study. Um, in this first study, we had 102 children in 21 settings participating. And I must say that um, we think this is quite good. This study was supposed to have started in April 2020. But um, I don't know if you know, but we had a pandemic started in March 2020 as well. 
uh, which meant that lots of nurseries closed down, some of them indefinitely, and the study was significantly delayed. And the ones that were open were obviously not, uh, they didn't have time to engage in this sort of research. And so we think that having achieved 120, um, 102 children in 21 settings was um, actually a very healthy sample, which enabled us to produce some interesting analyses. And what we did was a document analysis of the children's progress reports and of the Ofsted reports using a mixed methodology of qualitative and quantitative data um, analysis. And so in the uh, progress reports, we found 714 units of meaning, so things that describe the child's achievement against the earliest uh, foundation stage. We did it very rig rigorously with two independent researchers, uh, and then we um, calculated the percentage of agreement, which was very high in this case, 90, over 90 percent. Um, we also saw that aligned with what's expected in the in the population. Most progress reports had scores matching what is expected for that age uh, band of the child or beyond, and only a minority have a uh, few or no scores at, at the appropriate age level and uh, behind. So these were the ages uh, that the progress reports were um, developed at. We had a good distribution between boys and girls. We had 38 outstanding set uh, children attending outstanding settings, 64 attending good um, uh, settings, and 29 um, uh, attending settings in the most deprived areas, 43 in the considered mid-range in terms of deprivation, and 17 in the least uh, deprived. For this particular study, we are not considering settings um, where the rating of requires improvement, so it's just good and outstanding because those settings at that particular time uh, weren't available to give us the uh, children's progress reports, but for the second study we considered all ratings. And uh, the reports are between 2016 and 2019, so this is before any changes, uh, significant changes in Ofsted inspections were introduced, although we think that the changes introduced wouldn't necessarily have any implication in the results of this uh, study. What we did was we looked at the Ofsted reports uh, together, the two independent researchers, and we tried to identify the categories of things that were mentioned by the inspectors in each of these four areas, leadership and management, quality of teaching and assessment, personal development, behavior and welfare, and children's outcomes. And so these were the categories that we found and their frequency, and this is regardless of uh, the rating of the setting. So you can see that within effectiveness of leadership and management, uh, the most frequent thing that uh, inspectors look at is safeguarding, but also whether uh, they have staff training and CPD and also whether they have a system to monitor children's progress, which I think is quite interesting because one of the most recent changes introduced is that inspectors will not uh, um, ask for a system to monitor children's progress yet um, until last year. This was one of the most frequent things mentioned um, in the reports. In terms of quality of teaching, learning and assessment, the most frequent uh, issue that they will look at is how well the staff know the individual children and plan activities to uh, address individual children's needs and interests, and how well they make use of learning opportunities, um, a focus on language and communication, and also whether there is a wide range of um, activities provided. Within personal development, behavior, and welfare, um, they focus mostly on outdoor and exercise and the relationship of the children with the key staff, understanding of the world and whether there are nutritious meals. And in terms of children's outcomes, which I find quite interesting, uh, the most frequent mentions are about children making visible progress, literacy skills, and whether they are independent and confident and school ready. When we look at uh, when we perform more in-depth analysis, statistical analysis based on the offset rating, we find that rated, set rated settings are more likely to have a men in there was to investment in staff training and development, high aspirations from managers, and having a system to monitor children's progress and establishing links with other professionals and having a balanced curriculum. So if you are a nursery manager and you're going to have a, um, an offset inspection, uh, likely, statistically, 
these are the things that uh, they are going to look at. And if you want to have a rating of outstanding, these are the things that you should invest on in terms of leadership um, and management. In terms of quality of teaching, uh, uh, learning and assessment, outstanding settings are more likely to have a positive mention on uh, use of creativity and imagination, early numeracy, and to make use of learning opportunities. And this is quite interesting because early numeracy is actually not one of the most frequent things that they look at when they inspect settings. But if your setting is outstanding, likely you are doing a very good job in terms of early numeracy. And this is from the point of view of the inspectors, of course. Um, and a focus on language and communication is more frequent in the most deprived settings. We have more results in terms of deprivation, but I'm not reporting everything because we don't, uh, we don't have uh, time. Uh, in terms of personal development, behavior and welfare, outstanding settings reports mention significantly more frequently a focus on language and communication, um, having nutritious meals, especially in the wealthiest postcodes and um, hygiene habits. And in terms of children's outcomes, um, if you want to be rated outstanding, you uh, need to show your inspectors that your children are maintaining attention, uh, that disadvantaged children are showing progress, which matches the focus on having a system to monitor children's progress in leadership and management, um, but also that you're using children's imagination and uh, creativity as best as uh, you can. And so what we can see is that the combined effect of Ofsted rating and deprivation is not obvious and was only found for a relatively small number of statements included in the reports. Um, however, there are clear interactions between specific aspects of content and um, Os Ofsted uh, rating. It's important to highlight that we found no effects or interactions and we performed as many analyses as we could. There were no effects or interactions found between specific content of the Ofsted reports and the children's outcomes in any of the primary areas or specific areas of learning. Matching previous research, though previous research did it on a longitudinal basis, we looked at uh, one specific time point and there is no correlation between the outcomes of children in that time point and the Ofsted rating at the same time. Um, we in another in another paper, a sec second paper that uh, uh, we it's uh, currently under development, we performed what is called a sentiment analysis and text mining analysis of um, Ofsted uh, reports of uh, earlier settings using our software. So what what the software does is it looks at um, the documents and um, basically counts the frequency of words that are considered more positive, words that are considered more negative, words that are considered controversial, etc. Uh, and there is a huge database of which words are considered uh, what for researchers to use and input in this algorithm. And so we looked in this case at 279 Ofsted reports across all over the country um, to observe differences in content between them and to showcase the extent to which uh, Frobelian principles of pedagogy in early years are present, uh, specifically in the sections that we analysed before, leadership and management, quality of teaching, uh, learning and assessment, personal development, behaviour and welfare, and outcomes for children. So what we did was we developed a, a protocol for text mining where uh, we included keywords and expressions associated with key Frobelian principles. So, for example, um, we looked for the words autonomy and independence, which are related um, uh, to the extent to which reports look at the value of children as autonomous learners. We looked at play and creativity and related words such as creative, for example. Uh, we looked at outdoor to look for evidence of assessment of children's creativity and symbolic activity in the reports, um, the central importance of play and engagement with nature, which as we all know are Frobelian principles. We also, in addition to that, listed all the words present in the reports and their frequency. Um, and for example, I'm just going to report some of these results because it's quite extensive. So I just picked uh, some and in terms of quality of teaching, learning and assessment, play, which as we know is central, is only mentioned in 52.7% of the reports. And I picked the quality of teaching, learning and assessment because this is the area where you would expect to see play mentioned um, a bit more often. 
However, in the same section, learning and skills are mentioned 80 and 65% respectively. Um, looking at the terms uh, correlated with these words, so this is another thing that we can do in the software, is look at um, words that correlate with each other in terms of how often they appear. We see that there is a preoccupation with this area, um, um, uh, which, which denotes uh, that there is a concern with teaching specific sets of discrete skills rather than holistic and play-based uh, development. In the personal development and welfare area, play is mentioned only in 39% of providers' reports. But here, the focus is clearly on whether staff encourages children to be autonomous and to engage in their own self-care. So autonomous in terms of self-care. And in the children's outcomes, which I think is quite interesting again, and it matches the analysis, uh, the content analysis that we did in the first paper, the most common expressions are those related to school readiness. So we're talking about expressions such as make good progress in their learning, prepared for the next stage, a lot about school, but suggesting yet again an almost sole focus on academic achievement as the outcome of early education and care, rather than the holistic development that we um, should be looking for. And then lastly, we did a, um, a we compared um, settings that were rated outstanding with settings that were rated uh, with other quality ratings, so good and requires improvement. And what we can see is that across all four areas, there is a relationship between being outstanding and having a more positive sentiment in the report. So if you have an outstanding rating setting, you're going to have lots of positive words and positive expressions about effectiveness of leadership and management, quality of teaching and learning, and personal development. But this doesn't happen, as you can see, the line is very straight in the last uh, graph in the outcomes for children. So this is what it means. It means that this actually doesn't happen. It's not significant in the outcomes for children, because regardless of whether the setting is rated outstanding or requires improvement or good, the outcomes for children seem very much focused on school readiness. And so the sentiment does not change. So um, the question is, should Froebel still be relevant today and how? As Ofsted recognizes and receives repeated calls to address the need to review its guiding principles and overall approach to inspection, um, we argue that looking back at Froebel may be helpful to move forward towards a much fairer process of quality assurance where children are recognized as whole beings and play their main language um, and also early education staff recognized for facilitating child's overall development rather than artificial indicators of uh, school readiness. And um, offset inspection guidelines could benefit substantially from a re-encounter with Froebel by refocusing on the whole child through play, creativity and imagination, reimagining re independence and autonomy in everyday life, reconceiving educators more as facilitators of that holistic growth and repositioning outcomes as participation, quality of life and well-being rather than school readiness and academic um, related skills. And this is all I have to say today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Susanna. That was really thought provoking. Um, and I feel like I've got a buzz of questions going on in my head. And um, sadly, in England, it kind of confirms some of those uh, discourses um, that you talk about. So um, I'm hopefully we'll have some more questions um, about that at the end. So thank you. It's really powerful, actually, to hear that. Um, I'm going to move on to the second presentation now, which will be examining the extent to which Frobelian pedagogy responds to social practice within the 21st century, foregrounding racial equalities with a view to developing a framework for mobilising anti-racism in practice. I'm really pleased, um, therefore, to introduce Simon Bateson, the co-director of Frobelian Futures, with Shaddai um, contributing um, a recording as part of the presentation. Simon will be introducing their current research project, Diversity and Unity, and how they are developing a new framework um, 
for schools and settings to better understand how racial inequalities can emerge between children through play and how they can be challenged by educators. So I'm pleased to um, introduce Simon. So thank you, Simon. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to be with you. And, and thanks for that introduction, Amanda. Um, yes, so this is a, a piece of research um, that we're really grateful to the Froebel Trust for supporting and, and putting their necks above the parapet on an issue which is precarious for many of us still to engage with. Um, this is the title of our work, Diversity and Unity, borrowing from Froebel's language there, developing an anti-racist framework within Frobelian pedagogy. And as you say, Shad can't be with us today and send his apologies, but wanted to speak to us briefly um, via video. Hi everyone, it's Shadai here. Sorry I can't be with you today, but given the collaborative nature of this project between Simon and myself, we thought it was important I just speak with you for a couple of minutes at the start. Now, this is an incredibly important, deep uh, and timely project for a number of different reasons. I think firstly, we're keen to look at anti-racism beyond those very explicit acts of prejudice and discrimination and instead interrogate those broader colonial and cultural norms that underpin, prefigure and shape, and shape the way in which race and difference is, is understood in everyday society, but more specifically in, in children's play encounters. Secondly, we think this is an incredibly, well firstly overdue project, but also incredibly timely given the current political context where we're seeing a real pushback by certain sections of uh, the media and populist political parties keen to stoke uh, a culture war and, and really sow division against any work uh, towards social justice um, and specifically towards uh, developing more anti-racist ways of knowing and understanding about our practice with young children. This is a small scale project and we're really hopeful that the findings um, should produce uh, and stoke more questions really um, and enable us to probe more and better understand that, that deeper way of how colonialism and colonial characteristics within our culture shape and prefigure racism. We're also hopeful um, intertwined with that Fabellian pedagogy and ethos that will work towards developing uh, and nurturing I guess some more anti-racist habits um, and different ways of thinking about how we relate to others and how we understand difference within society. So I'll leave it with Simon now to pick up on a few of those points within the rest of this presentation. Um, thank you all for, for joining us um, and I look forward to hopefully being with you live soon and presenting with, with Simon uh, together in the future. So I want to just start by talking briefly about what brought Shad and I into conversation because that's really where our work begins and it's it's really important to just spend a moment on it. Um, the key word there that I'm going to come back to in what Shad has talked about is prefigurement um, and prefiguring this work is us as individuals and our experiences of race and racialization. Shad and I are both practitioners. Um, Shad's background is as a practitioner. I'm a senior practitioner currently at Cowgate Under Fives Nursery in Scotland. Um, we met because we had this shared interest in open-ended subjectivity in early childhood um, and uh, came together at a conference on men in early years uh, and connected particularly there around our concern to challenge binaries that are often imposed in, in that discourse. But it was the murder of George Floyd and the resurgence of Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 that really brought anti-racism in early childhood education and care back to the forefront of our minds and we wanted to do something together on it. But first we needed to explore um, our own backgrounds and maybe some of the tensions, creative as well as more complex, in a black author and a white author, black and white practitioners writing together on race. So our first paper prior to this research grant from the Froebel Trust, um, which is now published, is called Liminal Relationalities on Collaborative Writing with, in and against race in the study of early childhood. And you can read that um, now. Um, the key kind of take homes from this, though, are about how our own racializations intersect. Um, the experience of um, blackness and of being white and we use kind of the capital on black and white and in inverted commas deliberately there and talk about that in our work 
More specifically, um, this paper opens up our understanding of links between whiteness on the one hand as a way of seeing the world imprinted by a long heritage of myths about white supremacy and overlapping that coloniality, the reason for those myths being written to justify historically the power of one group over another. These are myths that we want to break down and we draw in our work on Bakhtin and thinking in early childhood about the work of Jane White in New Zealand, who disrupts fixed understandings of identity and exposes how identity is a constant negotiation and act of play. And also the work of Deleuze, who emphasises our continuous becomings as human beings very sympathetically with Froebel's view of childhood and, and human being generally. And for us, within both of those, this idea of liminality, the spaces in between what we know, who we think we are, and what we can name. Crucially, we begin here to look at how that fluidity of identification, which can disrupt racialization and racism, shows up so strongly in early childhood and specifically in play. So we're really grateful to have received um, funding from the Froebel Trust to go deeper and go beyond this work. Um, and we're looking really uh, over, uh, currently at these three questions. Does Froebel speak to these issues? Uh, what role does play have in recreating or challenging racialized and colonial habits? And what are the implications for everyday practice? So before I go a bit further into that, we often feel it's important to briefly name a couple of myths about race in early childhood. Um, the first of those is this idea that children don't see race uh, and that critical race theory has no place in nurseries. And I just include a link there to a, a Telegraph article, um, which is kind of epitomizes uh, the, the uh, attack on, on any practice of practitioners who are being courageous enough to uh, explore these issues. We know that a range of studies indicates this isn't true. Three month old babies prefer um, faces from their own racial group um, or more comfortable, um, you might say. And nine month, old, nine month olds often use race to group people. Three year olds associate certain racial groups with negative traits. A majority of four year olds in the US and UK associate white skin with uh, wealth and higher status and other attributes um, already and race-based allegiances and effects including discrimination are widespread when children start primary school. A second myth is that if we don't see racist actions then there's no issue and we're really uh, grateful to the work of Chris Gain um, who wrote this book We're All White Thanks. Um, Chris's work really helps us to focus on how racial binaries and categorizations can latch on to subtler, already established, underlying beliefs, habits and material inequalities that aren't explicitly about race, but which enable racialization and racism. Gain makes clear that if we only look for explicit racism in, in our settings um, or racial exclusion, we're effectively trying to close the stable door after the horse has bolted and that this precursive material is as present in majority white settings as anywhere else, if not more so. The final myth we want to mention is the idea that black and white and other racial identities are fixed. Emma De Debiri really helpfully reminds us in this quote, she says, racial categories were invented to enshrine the idea of white supremacy. They're the product of Eurocentrism and colonialism. To act in ways that reinforce their fixedness rather than undermine them is to continue to operate in the terrain mapped out by white supremacy. That challenge of De Beers is not licensed to deny the unique experiences of children or adults who have and continue to be racialized in marginalizing ways, but to simultaneously shine a light on our capacity as individuals and practitioners to support, as Tina Bruce says, children's amazing potential to create new possibilities and ways of seeing and relating to the world.
beyond what they inherit from us. So on to our second paper in this series, which is the literature review of the current affordances for anti-racist practice in early childhood policy and practice, comparing Scotland and England. And we've just submitted this article for publication, so hopefully it will be available soon in the Journal of Early Childhood Research. Um, key findings from our work here are that early learning in childcare is routinely marginalised in um, anti-racism strategies, policies produced by education departments. Um, there is this focus, narrow focus on explicit racism, which ignores the precursive territory. So there's often a kind of nothing to see here, um, legitimization going on. Um, the neoliberal basis of education, and we take draw from Peter Moss's work strongly here as well, uh, promotes colonial habits. The multiculturalist diversity kind of lens that's very strong in, in as a strategy often is inadequate. It can be tokenistic and it can, can even whitewash um, racialization. There's a focus on adult, uh, child adult didactic interactions as a strategy rather than, um, or not also including um, uh, an awareness of what goes on um, among children and how we how we um, uh, can can liberate that or um, give children the skills to to do things differently. Um, it's very didactic, uh, and we know that the Tories, the Conservative government, sorry, over the last few years has been removing key inclusion uh, duties um, from the EYFS framework. A key body of work that um, has spoken to us in our literature review is that of uh, Jones and Ocken, um, who are writing about these underlying colonial behaviours as they describe them and habits that subtly promote um, whiteness or white supremacy in our organisational and cultural lives. And that, I think that phrase white supremacy is a very tricky one for us in a UK context. Um, and would really strongly encourage you to visit Jones and Ockham's uh, website um, that really uh, surfaces the, the nuances of that and, and tries to break it down in, in a way that is much less, I think, threatening to um, white uh, practitioners and, and others. But I want to just allow them to introduce their work in a couple of quotes. Um, they say white supremacy is a project of colonization. Colonization. It colonizes our minds, our bodies, our psyches, our spirits, our emotions, as well as the land and the water and the sky and the air we breathe. White supremacy tells us who has value, who doesn't, what has value, what doesn't, in ways that reinforce a racial hierarchy of power and control that diseases and destroys all it touches. And if that sounds very radical to you, I would just encourage folk to go back to Froebel's own radical writing about the long arm of Prussian imperialism at the time he was alive and working, the long arm into the realm of education and its cultural conditioning of childhood and see perhaps some really interesting parallels. Critically, our literature review looked at what we see as unique Frobelian affordances for uh, anti-racism. Crucially, Frobelian practice enables children to surface their realities, we think, through unadulterated play in ways which allow them and observant, well-trained adults to gain deep insights into the entanglements and the possibilities which are present to every individual child around identity and culture. Secondly, as Tina Bruce reminds us, Frobelian practice at its best enables children to experiment with rules, identity and the supposed objective realities of the world and remake them. So this quote from her here, in play there is no necessity to conform. Rules in play can be broken, created, changed and challenged. This enables children to face life, deal with and face situations, work out alternatives change how things are done and cope with their future. The potential within their play for children to disrupt colonial norms and behaviours then, even as they play with them, 
mustn't be underestimated. The third and, and final affordance that we'll mention just now is Froebel's keen observations about how children are drawn towards unity, to entangling the materials, the ideas and experiences which the adult world tries to keep separated, mirroring um, racial categorization. The Frobelian practitioner who can tune into this has a powerful opportunity, we think, to help children embed their own insight here into the unity that they find in diversity and likewise the diversity they can find in unity of experience. Again, the possibilities of this for anti-racist practice are huge. So this leads on to the third um, paper in this series that we're currently working on as a piece of ethnographic research into how colonial and decolonial affects show up in early childhood play, specifically in Frobelian contexts. We take again Jones and Ocken as our starting point and basis for an analytical framework here. They offer a set of colonial habits and decolonial antidotes um, which they introduce and I'll show you those in a moment. Just again this quote that culture is, a pow is powerful precisely because it's so present and at the same time so very difficult to name or identify. The characteristics we list below are damaging because they are used as norms and standards without being proactively named or chosen. They're damaging because they promote white supremacy thinking and they're damaging to both people of colour and to white people. So Jones and Ocken offer this framework of things that to be attentive to within cultures, within organisations and communities um, uh, and how they show up, the ways they show up and how we might begin to rethink and challenge them. Um, so I'll just let you read the glance over that list. Um, uh, many things here which I think will jump out to you immediately as being um, not a good fit with Frobelian practice and thinking. One of the purposes, they say, of listing these characteristics is to point out how organisations that unconsciously use them as their norms and standards make it difficult, if not impossible, to open the door to other cultural norms and standards. As a result, many of our organisations, while saying we want to be anti-racist and multicultural, really only allow others to belong if they adapt or conform to already existing cultural norms. So this is the challenge we think and the territory that we are in and that we really wanted to open in terms of understanding how children's play um, shows up alongside this and how it's liberated and supported by skillful practitioners. Our study is an ethnography by proxy. Um, we uh, really believe in the importance of the close knowledge that practitioners have of children and, and um, wanting to give them the skills and reflective space and capacity, some tools to think about these issues for themselves. The, the key questions, and this is in two Frobelian settings, one in Scotland and one in England, that we were inviting um, them to think about through observation is um, are they seeing children, for example, stuck in any of those uh, habits effects um, or tropes stuck in black and white thinking, for example, or alternatives showing up, holding multiple possibilities in mind and in their play at once, for example. Tina again talks about this in some of her work as inclusive play, for example. And then also within our study, um, uh, we wanted to follow up the, the observational phase with dialogue um, with practitioners about the role, um, uh, the adult role in this uh, space and um, deeper reflections, revisiting the Frobelian affordances that practitioners perceive in this territory and what might enable colonial or decolonial habits um, further in practice. So finally, just um, some initial analysis, um, and we're, we're still um, uh, working through the data in conversation with practitioners. Uh, so it's early days, but it's really very, very, been very, very interesting um, to um, look through the observations and see what's coming up. Some of those are that the way that play can move and switch between colonial and decolonial very quickly, and children can be very creative with these tropes as they explore them, as they test them out. 
um, that some habits, um, uh, some tropes, characteristics of play can be interpreted potentially as either colonial or decolonial on one side on, or both sides simultaneously. So it's complex territory. Similarly, um, inclusion and exclusion can um, occur at the same time. They can be codependent. Uh, the importance of materials in settings um, where materials are very uniform or where materials are very diverse, where children are e enabled and allowed to um, uh, be very exploratory, exploratory in how they mix materials. Um, this can also support um, uh, decolonial tropes of more nuanced, um, more fluid, more liminal ways of thinking and being to show up. Uh, the importance for practitioners of letting colonialities occur uh, and seeing what resolves and, and often trusting children's um, uh, relationality and, and experience to work through some of these difficult things rather than short circuit them with early adult intervention. Um, how children's identity uh, shifts, the fluidity that's involved there in, in, in their play and the, how the nonverbal and embodied play of, of children, um, pre-verbal or, or just children who are choosing to play silently, can create real affordances for attunement. So we're really fascinated to continue to do this work and look forward to publishing it. Again, thank you to the Froebel Trust for supporting the journey that we're on. Um, and our first article uh, is, as I say, there that you can read if you want to be, uh, go a little bit along the, the way with us. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Simon. Um, again, another really thought provoking uh, presentation. Um, I thought it was really helpful thinking about breaking down those myths. And you did this so eloquently with informed research about reconceptualizing and understanding racial thinking. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, and again, sort of interweaving some um, worthy follow up research around Jones, Jones and Oaken, Bactin and Deleuze as well and linking that to Froebel so I thought that was really thought-provoking and again has raised some really good questions um, that we'll be sharing um, in a little bit. I'd like to introduce now our third presentation um, and this is an ISERA special interest group um, comprising of academic teachers and researchers and today we will be um, I will be introducing Angelica Poppy and Donna Gaywood, who will be sharing their research with yourselves. Um, this will be about supporting migrant and refugee children in schools and settings. The ASIRA Special Interest Group is an international co collaboration of five early years researchers who share a commitment to support children and families of refugee um, or migrant backgrounds within the early years. Using a Froebel Trust Grant, the project team developed a toolkit for educators to promote awareness and understanding of the challenges faced by migrant and refugee children. So for this presentation, they will be reflecting on their experiences of running workshops to support educators working with Ukrainian refugees, and they'll be sharing their mission to transform early childhood education and care settings. They'll be discussing the international project, which aims to determine the difficulties that young children face after crossing borders in relation to their identity, role and relationship and ways educators can best support migrant and refugee, refugee children in schools and in earlier settings. So I welcome you both um, and thank you for today. Thank you. Thanks for um, welcoming us. Um, <clears throat> I'm having a few technical issues. So um, if I get kicked out, uh, hopefully that won't happen, but Angelica will pick up from where I leave off. Um, Angelica, do you want to share the presentation in case anything happens to my um, internet? I'm really sorry about that, friends. It's just how it occurs. Thanks, Angelica. Do you want to start the presentation? Is it okay now? Yeah, we got it. Thank you. So, um, so as uh, as we've just been introduced, um, yeah, we're an international group with an international project, and we've been um, looking at how to support inclusive education for refugee and migrant children in early years settings. 
Um, do you want to click on? Yeah. So um, just to introduce ourselves, we are a special interest group um, and we uh, from ECERA, which is the European Early Childhood Education Research Association. And uh, we <clears throat> came together in 2019 in just, just before the pandemic in Thessaloniki. Um, and we created a link. I don't know if any of you saw that um, there was a very giant puppet um, called Little Imal who, and there was a, a thing called the walk and it was a, a, a walk of a puppet. She was, I think she was, I can't remember how tall she was, she was enormous. And she walked from the border of Syria, uh, right the way across Europe and up through England and to Manchester. Um, and it was an arts-based, um, it was an arts-based walk and it linked with communities and the the children and young people in the communities were asked to perform acts of welcome, kind of arts-based acts of welcome, um, which they did uh, really beautifully and it was different right the way across the world and we became involved with them and some of us managed to get to some of the the, the walk in in England and across Europe. Um, what we found with them was when we started working with them, they had an educational pack which they wanted to give out to the children, young people as they were going across uh, Europe, but we, they didn't have um, a pack for early early childhood. And we felt, I mean, and that is one of the principles that um, early childhood should be seen as, as a, an important part of childhood in, its, in and of itself, we thought it would be really important to create a resource pack for early years educators. And so that's what we did. Um, and then we decided that we were going to try it out in different countries. Um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Angelica, do you want to? So this is our um, research team. We're representing them today. And for various reasons, they're not able to to be with us. Um, Jennifer's in Australia. Um, she's from a Greek background. Um, Josie uh, is in Manchester. Alison, London, there's me, and I work for the University of Gloucestershire. And Angelica's in Poland, but from Ukrainian, uh, from Ukraine originally. If you want to, if you want to have a look at our research, uh, our education pack, you can click on that link which will take you there. There is a downloadable copy, so it can be used now in, in early childhood education and care settings. Um, okay, okay, so um, just very briefly, just thinking about how um, our pack has linked with Fro the Frobelian sort of principles. So for us, um, it, it isn't just so much about the pack, but it's also about how we work together and how we work with people as well is, one of the reasons we wanted to create the pack um, was, was because what we all of us are engaged either in practice or in research or both and what we noted was that for refugee children or migrant children they often in early education settings they're very isolated um, and although um, and I suppose it builds on what the Simon was saying previously um, <clears throat> There is, there is this level of isolation that is kind of invisible and there's an invisibility that happens. And we were very keen for children to become connected and not, not, not so that um, they were being forced to not have their own identities, but they could be connected as themselves, if that makes sense. Um, and the, we, obviously the walk itself um, was centered around um, a giant puppet and a lot of the work that that happened as a result of um, the pack was centered around puppets which was we, we'll talk about that later and the pack itself is um, uh, play-based it's it's play-based um, and it's um, it's also trauma-informed and and deeply inclusive um, and the I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, about relationships matter. Okay. Um, so we, the methodology we used um, when we started was we had sort of two, two parts to our sort of theory and methodology. Um, refugee crit, crit theory was kind of based on 
uh, critical race theory, um, but it was it has been developed by um, Strickell over Hughes and Wang. Um, it, the reason we like this one is it uses stories, um, and we think that that's really powerful for young children. Um, it's concerned with lived experiences, again, powerful for young children. And it also takes into account the political and personal aspects of refugees' lives, because ref being a refugee is a really political um, space. And if you think that um, politics doesn't impact children, you just need to take a look at very young children's ref refugee children's lives and you'll see that it does. Um, and praxeology, and I don't know if many people know about praxeology, um, but it's a, a, a very, uh, it's a, an educational um, uh, methodology that's, that's, that's based on this notion of attached research. The relationships matter. It's very ethically orientated um, and it takes into account some of the power relationships because um, when you're working with refugees, there are um, some very subtle power relationships and some very unsubtle power relationships, but it takes into account um, the, the importance of voice for the underrepresented. So we use both of those as our methodological ways to go about our research. Um, I'll just talk briefly about ethics for us as a group has been extraordinarily important. Um, possibly because we all have this five of us and we all have a multitude of reasons for um uh being part of the group and um, we come from very different backgrounds so what we wanted to do there was a group of researchers um who were doing some work um with indigenous women um and they wanted to really interrogate their positionality like how they positioned themselves because particularly with refugee and migrant children, how you position yourselves sort of against uh, with each other, but also how you position yourselves in terms of um, children is really important because there, there are so many difficulties and differentials around power. So what we did was we all wrote um, letters um, talking about our positionality just as a beginning to start to really in interrogate some of the ethics around power. Um, and there were there were lots of benefits and there have been and we continue to work as a group an international group there's lots of benefits of that and it's great but there's also been a lot of challenges because we think differently we come from different cultures and sometimes communication can be quite complex um, and so we've had to work very carefully with that but also with the educators that we worked with. Um, so these are where our agreed values and a lot of them, um, I suppose, sit nicely with, with the Frobelian principles. So we agreed that we would sit in solidarity with each other, but also sit in solidarity with refugees across the world and migrants across the world. Um, and that was a very strong basis for our work. We wanted all of our work to be play-based. Um, we're very keen for inclusion um, because we were concerned that there are inclusive practices, but were they good enough to include children who are very, very invisible um, and, uh, and can be perceived in ways that maybe aren't particularly helpful for them? We wanted them to be, we wanted, we've always worked in a hope based way with each other, with um, the practitioners who've tried out the pack for us. Um, and, and thinking hopefully about the future. We also wanted to um, conceptualize the children in a strength-based way. We didn't want this trope of poor refugees. They've had such a bad time and we're now going to save them. We recognize that refugees are people of self-rescue and that the children have um, deep senses of, of strength within them. And we wanted to recognize that. But equally, we wanted to um, be really clear that many children have experienced trauma. But again, we recognise that trauma isn't just relating to refugee children. There are many host children, children from the countries, receiving countries who also receive trauma. So the pack is a very trauma informed pack. And there's a lot of blurb at the front of it about how to use it in a trauma informed way. And we obviously, uh, I say obviously, but we have based it very much within the rights of the child. Okay.
is this is this me yes this one's me so basically what happened was we wrote the pack um based on the prints the 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 themes that the walk the original walk had kind of out, outlined um and we were able we just we asked it we wanted to test the pack because um anyone can make an educational pack and we were rec we recognized that anyone can make a re an educational pack but we were we, we were bringing our own um experiences our own research and, uh, and our own practice to this but we wanted to make sure that our pack had been tested that it was evidence-based and that it was rigorous um, so what we did, and we wanted it to be culturally um, applicable in a wide range. So we asked people in Turkey, Greece, Australia, in the UK, in the first phase, to try the pack out and then to feedback to us. Um, and we had lots of interaction with them and they've, uh, you know, uh, sent us lots of artifacts and we've talked and, and all the rest of it. And then the second phase more recently, which is where Frobel became involved, was in Poland uh, with... Um, uh, Ukrainian refugees so that that's that was how we implemented the toolkit right I think Angelica do you want to take over from here yeah thank you thank you Donna hi hello my name is Angela Popek I'm based in Poland and that's why we have the second phase realized in Poland and uh, when I came through um, closer through the principles of, of uh, referendum principles I found out there's a lot of common of what I have done uh, previously in Poland, and that's how we decided to implement it. It also correlated with the two very important, like three very important events happened in Poland uh, and, and in Eastern Europe uh, recently, um, be besides COVID and also implications in uh, teaching and working with children, particularly with children of migrant and refugee background. Um, there were uh, two um, periods and, uh, and optical waves of refugees arriving to Poland. First happened uh, two years ago, a and a half on the border with Belarus. Um, when um, people from the Middle East and, and um, Eastern uh, and Central Asia were trying to um, cross the border uh, for uh, different reasons. We're not uh, discussing that uh, reasons here. We're talking mostly about children and their being in Poland and, and in, in Polish uh, um, educational settings. And the other one, of course, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and, and um, a lot of children came here with their mothers uh, and uh, were located in different settings, uh, which um, also um, revealed some um, already existing problems uh, in the settings. And uh, to, we have done two evaluations, first in the first phase and the, in the second phase after the implementation in different countries. And, and there were a lot of implications it's, I move up here yeah, there were a lot of implications but uh, we thought that we can present them according to the state it doesn't mean that uh, the same implication didn't appear in the other states in the other countries it means that, that they, they are where the most visible uh, in the um, prep, um, in the presented states for example in Australia during the implementation uh, there has been revealed a great symbolism of a puppet and used um, as a mall or different later on used different puppet for play-based activities or not not only uh, but also talking about their own uh, emotions or, or presenting different um, daily activities by children uh, in Greece we sorry I will move myself here uh, in Greece we thought that the most prominent issue was the community cohesion uh, and children's understanding of who they are. Uh, Greece also has different background, the same as Turkey with refugees, uh, um, quite different uh, from other countries, particularly from Poland. Um, in the UK, um, we figure out uh, the most prominent issue was the enhancing children's learning um, through the curriculum and contributing to the basic curriculum in the settings, in the, in the education. In Turkey, we observed 
actually the educators observed uh, and underlined the improved relationship between children uh, during using the, the um, proposed toolkit. And in Poland, there is the need for regular use of the themes and activities uh, to embed the philosophy of the toolkit. And I will briefly further present some of the works and discuss some of the findings. Of, uh, over here, uh, we can see different works uh, done by children in uh, Australia, representing uh, the puppet in different uh, postures and positions and situations. And the education uh, uh, educators uh, stated that uh, while talking about different hard situations or emotional situation or even everyday, uh, everyday uh, activities, it was easier for children to use that puppet and, and uh, to uh, transit their own emotions or experiences and disclose through the puppet, um, which uh, was uh, very supportive for them and gave them um, a kind of um, uh, autonomy uh, and, and they could take a lead into their um, narratives. Um, yeah. uh, in the other um, page here, you can see also the works, uh, a little bit of lower quality, sorry, um, done by children in uh, Greece. Uh, while children were doing different activities proposed by the toolkit, they also developed uh, further activities by themselves. And that one um, made a poster which they, uh, with your educators and families, distributed and posted in different places, uh, claiming the peace for children and equal education. And uh, here that also uh, points out to uh, uh, the need for every child to be included uh, and not only legally included in the educational, uh, in the educational setting, but to find their own place in, in their own setting. Moving. Yeah. Um, the other theme that, that we've noticed during the implementation, the improved relationship between children while talking, um, you know, because most of the activities and most of the themes, there are seven themes here, is one of them is welcome and proposed activities and suggestions. Um, most are not only play-based uh, uh, and give much more freedom than, than um, the regular activities to, to children, but they are also reflexive, It means the educator uh, was trying to uh, provoke uh, some conversation uh, or giving the feedback what children are doing, why, uh, how they are feeling, and uh, when children were, were able to talk about your playing experiences, they could, but if not, they, they uh, communicated in different way through the play, through or uh, through drawings, where, for example, building um, uh, and other activities. Uh, and here yeah, the educators stated that through all the use of the activities within few months, uh, there can be could be visible uh, the improvement of the relationship between some children, what might give a hint uh, that children could uh, had a clear understanding what migration or refugee experience might mean, but not only uh, just pointing to the diversity and inclusiveness of all the uh, children um, and um, pointing uh, rather to personality than to the political issues of migration. Um, the next very important thing, particularly visible in Poland, as Poland um, before uh, had a very little contact with refugee and migrant children, um, uh, the PAC revealed that there is a strong need for regular use of such uh, play-based activities, um, uh, which will help to embed the philosophy of the toolkit uh, and make the educators and um, be more trauma aware and uh, um, children experience more aware what children come through um, because uh, it appeared uh, here in Poland, um, teachers at, at the beginning of starting to use the use for um, 
six months at the beginning, it was very hard to understand how to use the pack. They needed more guidelines. Um, and many um, times they thought this is one time activity, not the whole uh, approach of philosophy. And we're, we're trying just to incorporate with their current uh, curricula. Uh, and I have uh, two more uh, issues to raise and we are going to finish because I see that we are running out of time. Uh, uh, what is also important that the activities that we propose in the toolkit pointed out to the sensitivities of the issues raised and that sensitivity was seen among the children that, that, that no children could communicate as teachers also expected uh, them or educators expected them about their feelings, about their homes. As in Poland, for example, there is a, 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 a strong dispute about whether to talk to Ukrainian children about war, about their family, who mostly uh, half of the family is left back in Ukraine, uh, whether to talk about their homes which might be destroyed or not, or whether not to raise these questions. And if not, then when is the time to raise? Right? So he has, um, it will be very supportive for educators to give a hint, just give the input how to work with children uh, and be aware of trauma rather than just doing single uh, activities or regular activities. And the last, what we also uh, found out, there, there were a lot of unseen, but most, they, they were, same but no planned impact of the toolkit. Uh, for example, as one only one example uh, in Greece, but also in Poland, there were a lot of cases when uh, well, after doing the activities, after after dragging that uh, philosophy that we propose based on the principles, uh, children came with the initiative, for example, to collect food or medicine or some clothes for Ukrainian children or in Poland, uh, children uh, with their parents decided to collect money for Ukrainian children to be able to participate in some social events or excursion trips, for example, which they had to pay for. And thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you for that. Um, and it again, another powerful presentation, um, really uh, thought provoking um, and yeah, um, some links to praxis, some a couple of questions that have come through. So really helpful. I'd just like to invite um, everybody to pop their cameras back on that was presenting um, because there are some questions that we can um, share together. There's quite a few directed questions. Um, so I think what I'll do is I will uh, just start with um, Angelica and Donna. Um, and I think in part, you've answered some of these. So one of the questions that um, came up was thinking about, um, have you got plans? And I think you did kind of say this later on. Have you got plans of working with refugees in other countries, such as South Asian countries, for example, Pakistan? Um, and following on from that, are you going to bring the toolkit to Portugal as well? So I think there was lots of international voices. <laughs> Right. We, we, I mean, the toolkit's readily available. Yeah. If anyone wants to <clears throat> work with us to try it out, we're really happy. Um, if they want to um, connect with us, we're, we're more than happy with that. But it is available on our website. And there is a webinar um, that you can use um, if, <clears throat> if you, for extra training. I don't think you can just pick it up and just go for it. Uh, what we're really hoping to do next is to find... Um, some funding so that we can try the toolkit out in a refugee to where we're next if we can get that funding because we want to know if it can be done within a refugee camp itself as well as in early education but anyone who wants to contact this please feel free we're very open Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and there was just another point uh, before I move on to some of the other directed questions to the other speakers. Um, I thought this was a really interesting point because it connected with something I sort of recorded about um, the visibility um, and the importance of stories. So I thought that was really um, 
interesting in terms of really gaining that lived experience um, and thinking about the political and the personal aspect of everyday lives. I think that's really important, particularly as you're working, like you said, in an international group as well. Um, and somebody um, posed the question, or really, I guess, in a way, a question straight statement about thinking about micro practitioners as well, and that they can be seen as less visible due to differences in backgrounds and cultures and practice and their different viewpoints in early childhood settings. And the research they were saying is really helpful for those migrant practitioners as well. So I thought I'd share that because I thought that was really <clears throat> quite can important. I, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's probably worth saying that um, there was um, some in Australia, that some of the practitioners in Australia, they came from a vast um, array of, of, of backgrounds and they found use app, it actually supported them to explore their own identities personally but also as a team but with the children so it was re we found that particularly in Australia it really promotes well no that's not true actually also in Greece in a different way but it really promoted community cohesion so I would say yes I we appreciate and I think it fits nicely with what Simon and Shad Shad I were saying about that invisibility sometimes of, of people but yes it's a an important point um thank you for that I guess again just <clears throat> a, a quick question really because I know people can access it but is there um somebody's asked about the specific age range in the toolkit um I'm assuming early years um in terms of the age range the yeah the mm -hmm. focus yeah. Yeah, um definitely. and then somebody sorry somebody's also asked um about can you uh, say a little bit more about how the packs were designed to be identity informed to cater to children from different backgrounds and who have different lived experiences were refugee and host communities involved in designing these packs i think in part you sort of discussed that i'd love to know more about your future plans for the packs as well so again Mm, yeah, I mean, you can, can you, I don't know, <clears throat> Angelica? Yeah, I, I, I can say, um, and you can uh, contribute if I don't, uh, if I miss something. Uh, first of all, every activity uh, that we suggest, we suggest also the age uh, um, to which uh, group it can be applied, or if it can be applied to different age group, we suggest what changes uh can be made um and we find out for example in poland that is a little bit different than than from the first phase as in greece and turkey for for example uh, and some younger children um are not used to talk about their um emotions or about their homes for example they are less reflective in some cases so it's there's a need to provoke it so it <laughs> might be in different countries and different cultures different issues so and and then there's a need to adjust the pack to different cultures so what we do in the different language um versions of the pack as uh, so far we have polish and ukrainian versions of the pack on that and talking about the identity each activity also we give the suggestions of how to to use it and how to talk to children or how not to talk what not to do, what to be aware of, uh, what sensitive issues it might raise, uh, which words um, are, are best not used to as, for example, refugee, uh, a migrant, you are a migrant child. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank can you. I, can I just say, can I just say about, <clears throat> um, you, in our group, there's so in that sense, um, it was put together by people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. Just, can you hear me? Did that work? Yeah, you've come back. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear what I said about us being from refugee and migrant backgrounds? So, so it was it was very much from our own lived experiences. Yeah, thank you. I think that's important. There's some questions for Simon as well, Simon. Um, Quite a few questions that have come through. Um, I think there's some quite big questions as well. I'm not sure you're going to be able to do, do a lot of them um, in the time. But one of the questions was, have you done any studies um, about children's ideas about how race develops for those children themselves? Um, and um, particularly with those children that are only exposed to one ethnicity. And does this differ for those children's ideas about race that are exposed to much more of a multicultural environment? 
So it's a great question, and we haven't mm -hmm. done that studies, but there are studies on that. I and mean, I referenced Chris Gaines' work, and I'd, which is a book called "We're All uh, We're All White Thanks," and I'd really recommend that. Um, uh, and the, the temptation, if you're in an all white or, or in a single ethnicity or a majority ethnicity setting to to see for children and adults to see the world through a homogenous lens, it says that, you know, that's that can be a strong impetus in in practice and in culture, but equally diverse settings. Um, uh, ethnically diverse settings can also homogenize um, and you know I give the example of diversity day as a kind of catch-all for acknowledging and celebrating diversity it's a bit like the life of Brian's we are all individuals you know moment um, so but I, I think at the same time and I, I would reference Derman Sparks work on this a book called what if all the kids are white um, really drawing our attention to um, the capacity that any setting has to really draw out the diversity in children's ways of seeing um, the world, um, their ways of playing, the diversity in that, in their family and cultural histories, this kind of the myth that if we're all from a, a, a single ethnicity background, then our, our um, family histories are going to be all similar and actually there's you know huge difference and diversity which can be brought to the surface but children are bringing that difference and diversity to the surface in their play continually it's up to us as skilled and uh, responsible practitioners to be um, to be you know noticing that and building on it and spotlighting it and celebrating it rather than kind of playing into homogenizing um, practices which you know as our presentation on Ofsted um, already suggested is is a risk that is coming at us from many directions. Mm. Thank you thank you Simon and I think um, another just before um, I move on to Susanna as we close today um, was thinking um, really about that kind of um, really sort of informed understanding that you've given about diversity and sort of thinking about that um so it, we're moving away from this kind of tokenistic approach that you mentioned as well and somebody has asked can you suggest a way to begin an anti-racist framework a discussion for families and staff um so i guess like it's just a kind of like a bite size of a starting point really in the few minutes that we've got <laughs> For, for for me and Chad, I think we yeah we're, we're working towards towards some sort of tool toolkit framework, other resources that are going to be very practical for practitioners. But we really want to do this kind of in depth work of thinking about how the theory kind of can apply to practice through a Frobelian lens and move away from that kind of narrow focus on explicit racism, which then only sees a small fraction of what we're talking about, um, to that wider, um, uh, hopefully really productive creative lens. Thank you. Thank you. That's really, that's really helpful. I just want to um, move on to Susanna because um, I appreciated Susanna as well that you had responded to quite a few questions at the beginning, which um, just to sort of clarify that for everybody, somebody was talking about, can you clarify the years of the inspections that you were analysing? And that was 2016 to 19. Um, one of the questions that was sort of bubbling through my mind um, was about the the inspectors themselves and their own background and how that's influential having um I guess in my own experience anecdotally gone through a number of Ofsted inspections and how that can be influential um, in terms of um, what they view as quality. And this came through with um, a question as well. Have these findings been presented to Ofsted and have they responded? Um, and I think you had said something, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that in terms of um, maybe the identity of the Ofsted inspectors themselves. I know you looked at the reports, so maybe that wasn't a focus. Um, yeah. I don't know if you say anything. That's, that's a really, really interesting question. Thank you. So so yes, we didn't um, specifically look at that because that wasn't the objective of this particular study. Um, but actually, my plans is to, because now we have the tools, we've done this analysis with our software, so now we have the tools and the system up and running, so we can actually do that. We can look at differences between instead reports per inspector. And I think, I mean, it's publicly available. So I think this will be a really interesting research and it's something I plan to do in the near future. And then hopefully we can look at other you know, variables that relate to the identity of each inspector. I would love to be able to interview them directly 
um, I will uh, send this research to, to Ofsted once it's um, published and in, in good shape, hopefully soon. So we will issue a brief to them. Um, and I will let the trust know if they respond to us so we can disseminate the response um, as well. Thank you, Susanna. That's really helpful. And I think there were a few questions because um, I'm conscious um, we've only got a couple of minutes. There were a few questions posed as well. And I think some of them both, well, for all three groups, really, was kind of like what was happening next? What are you going to do? There was a question about um, have there been larger studies with Susanna's about collecting data from receptionist schools and considering school readiness? Uh, there was something around Simon's about um, what you're doing next. And I think it's been really helpful this morning because you kind of signposted those next steps that you will be doing and I think sharing um, the recordings of this as well will identify some of um, your current readings and your research and then being able to map kind of watch this space really in terms of what you're going to do next so I thought that was really helpful. Um, there was um, a question um, for just literally just to finish off which is probably quite a big question but it was for Simon and about expanding on the neoliberal agenda that promotes colonial habits. Um, it's a bit of a loaded, I know it's a bit of a uh, loaded question, quite a big question, but I don't know if you just want to kind of sum up um, the thinking around that. What a great way to go into a Saturday afternoon. Um, well, just to plug, actually, just to build on your plug, because the Frobel Trust website will have all of our research um, and will be, people will be updating with their findings and, and outputs there. So on, neo, on neoliberalism um, and, and anti-racist practice, I mean, Peter Moss's work and with Guy Roberts Holmes has been really important here, kind of the overlap between kind of promotion in the curriculum of individualism of um of progress of kind of um you know um uh, singular kinds of knowledge um moss's idea of childhood children and he talks about the idea in our in our culture of children as a foretold becoming um and we really want to challenge that so i mean there's a i would direct you to their work as as a really um, inspiring starting place yeah, fantastic. And I think, yeah, I would um, completely agree with that. And again, sort of um, making those links to other researchers, but also within yourselves as well. I think there's some, you know, the interconnection between all of your work has been um, really inspiring this morning and, you know, fascinating um, in for lots of different reasons and lots of different ways. And I think it's really provoked um, a lot of thinking and reflecting as well. So I really thank you um, for sharing your project this morning. Morning. Um, it's been really, really um, valuable. Um, and I'd like to welcome Sasha back now um, to make her closing um, talk for this morning. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much, Amanda. So I want to close the conference with just a few uh, comments and reflections, really. Um, first of all, I'd like to say huge thanks to Helen and Emma and Sarah and Nadia to Susanna, uh, to Judith and Feng Ling, uh, to Simon and Shaddai, and to Donna and Angelica and their colleagues, but also to our fantastic uh, chairs, Amanda and Sandra, and to Mark for opening the conference for us. Um, as I was listening, I was writing copious notes, and I suddenly began to think, what connects everything um, in what we've heard this morning? The presentations have been hugely diverse, but there are, there are I think, um, some common themes um, and issues that have been raised, and I just wanted to touch on those. I wanted to really try to answer my own question, which is, so what do these Frobelian educators, Frobelian educational researchers, and Frobelian research seem to embody? What might they have in common? I'm very conscious of what um, Simon has shared with us both about Jones and Ockham's um, characteristics around uh, perfectionism, urgency, defensiveness, and I absolutely don't want to try to claim any of those characteristics for what we've heard this morning. I'm also conscious of Simon's comment around identities being fluid and not fixed. But some of the themes that I felt um, were being embodied this morning by our Frobelian researchers and in, in the Frobelian research and education that has been shared 
are, and it's a long list, I warn you, but I'm going to whiz through it, as well as diversity, um, being very inclusive. We've heard about research that starts really from birth and goes all the way up to Jerry at 91, which I thought was absolutely lovely. Um, all our presenters and their colleagues are enormously knowledgeable. They're closely connected to their contexts, their subject areas, the wealth of literature that sits around, behind and to which they're contributing. And of course, to their colleagues, children, families and communities. I think they've all exemplified being inquisitive and exploratory and being learners themselves who are becoming and liminal and brave, willing to try out new things, to learn from their own mistakes and not to claim to be perfect. perfect. I think we've heard a lot about being ethical, whether that's been um, labelled as ethics or exemplifying very sensitive, thoughtful, respectful, ethical being and behaving and thinking. It's very clear that there's a huge amount of organisation that goes on, lots of planning, lots of thoughtfulness. The research we've heard about is very participatory. It's very creative. I love the, the idea of uh, the parents wanting to, to, to make something purple with the child and using turmeric because they didn't have food colouring, for example. All, all our uh, educators are hugely committed. They are connected closely and intimately to real world issues of early childhood education, of children and families and their realities. They're sensitive, for example, being sensitive to parents' anxieties, children's anxieties about being in the forest, um, or coming back to nursery or coming to nursery during uh, the COVID pandemic. I think they're also demonstrating huge pragmatism, resourcefulness and versatility. The work they're doing, I think, is transformative. It's aiming to make children's lives and learning and experiences and relationships better. So everything is relational. Of course, we've heard about intergenerational work today. We've heard about being non-judgmental. And I really felt that there was a strong energy that came from all our presenters and their projects. They are themselves energetic. Their work is systematic. It's analytical but it's also caring, and we might even say loving. They're conscious of subjectivities. They've all, I think, been excellent communicators. They're symbol makers, they're storytellers. They're hopeful. They disrupt the norms and take them for granted ideas. Their work is timely, it's non-discriminatory, it's anti-racist, and they're striving to be socially just and to promote social justice and equity. They're also open of, in heart and mind, I think, to questions, to being reflexive, to being challenged, to engaging in dialogue and to embracing that fluidity. Perhaps above all, I would say that they're principled and it has for me been a real pleasure to listen to all of them this morning. I hope it has for you too. And we've tried to share links throughout the morning um, to each uh, research project. But if you've missed those, because the chat has been whizzing along, please go to frobel.org.uk and search through the website. There's lots to explore there, but we have a research library, a research and project library, where you'll find links um, to all the projects and pages and information, um, links to external articles, uh, to the toolkit that uh, Donna and, Je and Angelica have created, um, to the Frobelian Futures website, to the Frobel Partnership website, where there's lots, lots more information. And I think this morning has been a real sense of community, a community of practice. If you are interested in connecting with other people who are themselves interested in Froebel. One way you might like to do that if you have access to Facebook is to look for the Froebel Network. Um, anybody can join the Froebel Network's Facebook group and I suggest if you want to see if there are people in your local area 
who might want to get together over a cup of tea, then um, just say your name and where you're based and is anybody else out there in the world in the same location as you. So I really like to thank everyone for um, being part of today, uh, all our presenters, as I say, but also all of you for joining us. And I'd also like to thank all my colleagues at the Froebel Trust for the huge amount of hard work that they've put in, in to organising today's conference. I wish you a very pleasant weekend and I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye.